Real stories of werewolves, the dogmen from history, from your emails, illustrated and animated with the democratizing magic of machine learning AI. Welcome to Scary Stories. Halloween season is here, so join with us in one full hour featuring some of our favorite werewolf transformation stories of all time. From forest ranger werewolf narratives to the legend of Smiths and the Werewolf, we've got it all here, and the episode begins right now. That girl turned into a werewolf begins at 922. But first this. The beautiful dog lady as told to Peter Bernard, read by P.Q. River. I'm a forest ranger, so I can't reveal my identity because this story could get me fired. However, ironically, these are the actual details of why I became a forest ranger in the first place. This all happened 22 years ago, the summer that I turned 13 years old. Most years I went to summer camp, but that year my dad started a new job in upstate New York. Money was a bit tight for the first few months, so neither of my parents minded when I asked if I could stay home for the summer, explore the area, maybe make some new friends. We lived on the outskirts of Woodstock, which by the 90s, when this happened, had already become a somewhat exclusive artsy community. Even though it's kind of almost in the country, all the kids I met had rich parents and a more sophisticated vocabulary. After a week and a half, I had settled in with a group that liked all the same bands that I liked, only they used longer words to explain why. One day, the crazy one in the group, who I will call Animal, because he reminded me of the drummer from the Muppets, started shouting, Let's go to Overlook! Everyone said no, and I kept asking, What's Overlook? But nobody would answer. Later that day, Animal finally told me it was like a giant forest, completely wild. Figures that he wanted to go there. But we didn't go to Overlook. Not that day. Not that week and not that month. Animal kept suggesting it, though, and the idea started sounding more appealing to the group until suddenly one day in the second or third week of August, there we were, hiking along the highway, heading toward the Overlook Mountain Wild Forest. None of our parents had any idea where we were, but I think mine were the only ones that might have cared. One of the other kids carried a cell phone, one of those early Nokia ones with the antenna that opened up with a keyboard in it, so if we got lost we could get rescued. By mid-1990s standard, I felt like I'd be pretty safe as long as I didn't stray too far from the group. Altogether, there were six of us, and although the others grew bored quickly on the walk there, I was happy just to be free and looking at the stuff one finds along the side of the highway. When we finally reached our destination, everyone perked up a bit and I got super excited. I remember running around with Animal, both of us so glad to finally be there at the now legendary Overlook. We both took turns chasing each other like puppies or kittens, which is essentially what we were. After a while, I noticed we couldn't hear the other kids anymore. I told Animal we'd better go back and find them. I wanted to stay close to the kid with the cell phone, reasoning that without that device, if we got lost, we would just be lost. Animal said, fine, let's go back, but first I gotta pee, and he disappeared into the foliage. So there I was, thirteen years old, in the forest completely alone. Tears welled up in my eyes, and I wished I could be home with my mother very badly. You are not going to cry. You are not going to cry, I repeated to myself internally, over and over. I called out to Animal in a shaky voice. Then I cleared my throat and called for him in what I thought was a more confident-sounding way. He did not respond. I continued to remind myself not to cry. I heard bushes moving further up the path must be animal. I felt a huge sense of relief knowing that at least I wasn't alone anymore. I was going to be nervous until I got back with the others, but this was a vast improvement in my situation. Except animal didn't come out of the bushes. An 
animal came out, but not my crazy friend. An animal came out of the bushes that looked like a dog, a very, very large dog. Walking on all fours, it was still taller than I was at that age. I was frozen in fear. I saw something on TV once that said if a predatory animal comes upon you in the wild, don't run. I forgot what it said you should do, but I remember it said to not run, so I didn't. I just stood there looking at an impossibly large dog or wolf. I guess it was more of a wolf than a dog. Its coat was a mix of grays and whites and silvers. It was really a beautiful creature standing there, half in and half out of the bushes, staring at me as silently as I was staring at it. Then it took a couple or three casual steps out of the forest, and I could see by the teats on its underbelly that it was a female, and by the enlarged belly that she was very, very pregnant. That's when she stood up. I mean, she was already standing up, but now she stood up on her two hind legs. I remember the world started shaking violently for a while. Then I realized it was me that was shaking. I suddenly felt intensely cold. I don't think the temperature changed. I just think the blood drained from my body out of fear. The she-wolf stood on her hind legs, now so tall that I can't even hazard a guess as to her height. Then suddenly she walked over and began smelling me all over as I held as still as I could. I've seen video of bears walking on two legs, and they're a bit clumsy. I've seen gorillas and chimps do it, and they're a bit more graceful. This dog lady walked as elegantly as a heavily pregnant lady can walk. She strolled as though this were something she did all day long, as though this was what her legs were designed to do. Well, as you might have guessed, she didn't kill me and eat me. In fact, Animal, the other animal, made so much noise coming back out of the woods that the she-wolf ran off. He found me there in some kind of shock, and I couldn't really explain to him what had happened. Somehow I don't remember, he got me back to the kid with the cell phone, and together we got my parents to come pick me up. At first, they banned me from seeing these kids ever again. Then dad found out that two of them were the kids of two of his bosses at work and the ban was immediately over. I never told any of them about the dog lady. Not my parents, not my friends. But her image fascinated me and led me to study animals in nature. I learned that this animal is not supposed to exist and is not even in the fossil record, so it should never have existed. Yet, I not only saw a member of this species in the flesh, very much alive, but I saw a pregnant member of this species. That means there had to also have been at least one male, and we know that soon after that came babies. There's a good chance that 22 years later, this species may very well still exist. But I won't get to see one of them in the flesh again if I'm sitting behind a desk all day working a normal job. And so I'm a park ranger, spending as much time as I can in the forest where this creature lives and where mystery and wonder are still absolute monarchs. It's a classic all over Play with the scary stories, guy. Today we've got a story sent in by a guy who claims this happened to him about 20 years ago when he encountered a classmate in his school who was different from everybody else. And this is the story of how she came to be called the Werewolf Girl. Dear Scary Stories, when I was in high school, There was this really weird girl in our grade that we all used to call Witch Girl because she was all goth and looked like she was going to put a hex on you. Everyone thought she was strange 
but it never bothered her. She was quite happy on her own and never tried to make friends with anyone. I don't think she was on any social media at all, and if she was, she certainly never friended anyone I knew. Although nobody I knew liked her, I always sort of admired her ability to just not care at all about social status or social issues. I kind of wondered if she might be cooler than everyone else. And besides, I thought she was strangely pretty. I wanted to be her friend, but she didn't make it easy. That's not to say she was ever rude to me. She wasn't, but she wasn't overly welcoming either. She would always do the minimum required to not be rude before extricating herself from any conversation that I attempted to start with her. Then, when we were seniors, we both had the same English class together. Our teacher was telling us about ancient mythologies, and when he showed us this dog-headed painting from old Egypt, she and I both shouted out at the same time, Dog Man! which broke the class up. So, then she became Werewolf Girl and I became Werewolf Boy, which was totally unfair, since neither of us had ever said anything about werewolves, we both said Dog Man. At any rate, on the way out of class, I apologized to her, saying I felt responsible for her new nickname. It wasn't true, but I was just trying to make conversation. She laughed and said she felt no responsibility at all for mine. The ice had been broken, so we talked on the way to lunch. Then, we ate lunch together. I was so happy to finally get to know this girl a little bit, I guess my confidence got the best of me, and I asked her to go with me to the movies that Friday night. I was so confident that when she said yes, I wasn't even surprised. So that Friday, we walked to the local multiplex and I let her choose what we would go see. Unsurprisingly, she chose a film about a serial killer. That was fine with me. I was hoping she would get scared so I would have an excuse to hold her and comfort her. No such luck. As soon as the killings started, she began laughing out loud. The gorier the attack, the funnier this girl thought it was. So she was too busy laughing and spilling her popcorn to have any time for snuggling. She was so loud with her laughing that other people were asking us to quiet down. I wasn't even making any noise and I was getting yelled at because of Werewolf Girl. But she didn't care, so I tried to shrug it off. After the movie, I was feeling a bit frustrated, but I offered to walk her home thinking maybe then I'd have one more chance for a hug when we reached her place. Heck, I would have been happy with a handshake by that point. I just wanted some acknowledgement of my existence from her. I had no idea where she lived since we had met near our school to walk to the theater. It turns out that to get to her home, you have to walk out of town and up this country road that the main highway replaced way back before I was born. Very few people go up there anymore. I know I had never been up there before. After we had walked a whole half hour and not seen one single person, I asked her how much further it was, and she only laughed. I started to wonder where she was leading me and if this was really where she lived. Then she walked off the road and through some overgrown grass toward the woods. Where the heck are you going, werewolf girl? I called out to her, not wanting to leave the road in the darkness. She told me this was the shortcut to her house, and I told her right back, this is not what I had signed up for. She giggled and said that if she got eaten by the big bad wolf, then it would be on my conscience. She looked so cute, smiling and giggling at me, that when she walked into the trees in the darkening night, I foolishly followed her. 
It turned out there really was a footpath there. I couldn't see it from the road, but it was unmistakably beaten down from years of use once we got past the first couple or three trees. I started to feel like I should calm down. She seemed to be on the level. But I wasn't calming down. Not at all. In fact, I was starting to wonder how I was going to find my way back in the dark. Even if I could make it back on this dirt road, would I remember where to go when I hit the paved road? Even if I made all the right turns, I still had an hour's walk ahead of me, and my feet were hurting already. I should have worn my sneakers, but I wore my shoes because I wanted to impress Werewolf Girl. She'd have been more impressed if I'd have worn a butcher's apron and carried a chainsaw. All she liked was scary stuff. And that's fine, but I mean, all she liked was scary stuff. And I don't know why, because nothing seemed to actually scare her. We could have been attacked by a bear at that moment, and it probably only would have made her giggle some more. None of this made me like her any less, of course. It only made her seem more exotic to me at the time. But finally, something happened that made me stop liking her. I guess the main reason we stopped being friends was that she ended up living up to her name a little bit too much. As we trudged up the forest path which supposedly led to her home, there was a flash of light and the sound of thunder very close by. If it started raining hard, this path was going to turn to mud very quickly. Werewolf Girl was climbing a short hill very fast and I called out to her, but she ignored me and hurried up and past some trees out of my sight. Grunting and struggling, I clambered up the hill after her and, out of breath, I called out to her to slow down. I really didn't want to get lost out there and I knew she would only find it funny if I did. Looking up that hill, I sensed eyes looking back down at me before my eyes actually met them. I began to speak to those two eyes, but I didn't even get one complete word out before my speaking turned to screaming and my climbing turned to falling backward. Those weren't the girl's eyes looking back at me. Those weren't human eyes at all. I wasn't sure what they were, but these were the eyes of a very tall creature. I landed hard on my back and got completely winded. I tried to breathe, but all the air had been knocked completely out of my lungs, so it was very painful and I had to use all my strength just to suck air back in my lungs. My eyes were tearing up, and I was flailing about, just trying to restore my most basic of bodily functions, when my tearing eyes opened and looked up as lightning flashed. In that one second, I saw a walking nightmare heading toward me. Unable to move or even sit up yet, I desperately gasped for air and blinked my eyes furiously trying to clear my vision. It looked like a giant hairy boogeyman was walking down the hill toward me and I had a real need to see whatever that was a lot more clearly. Still unable to breathe, I found myself on my side, kind of swimming through the dirt to get away from the figure before climbing up to all fours and then staggering away on two very unsteady legs. I was breathing loudly. I sounded like a broken accordion, but I managed to grab onto a tree and gasp for air long enough to look behind me. Another flash of lightning revealed that the thing was no longer pursuing me, but it was still staring directly at me. 
I didn't get to see it for very long, but I will attempt to remember as many details of what I saw as I possibly can. In front of me stood a man-like animal. But there's no way it was a man in a costume unless a werewolf girl is hiding a professional basketball player in those woods. The figure had to be over seven feet tall, and it was muscular too. I'm not going to give you any of that stuff about how I could see the muscles moving under the fur or anything like that, because it was dark, and mainly I saw its silhouette, its hair blowing in the wind, and its eyes glowing bright at me. I have heard other people say the dogman has yellow or orange or red eye shine. I don't honestly remember what color it was. I only remember my heart felt like it stopped for a second when I saw that thing. It was like my body was ready to give up and die just from the sight of this monster. It did have tall ears. I remember that specifically, which is why I didn't think it was a Sasquatch or Bigfoot. I thought I saw a werewolf. Of course, I had just spent the evening with werewolf girls, so lycanthropy would have been on my mind, but still, I saw what looked like a werewolf. And I saw a werewolf girl standing just behind him, staring at me the same as he was. Only she was smirking. This was still funny to her. And she looked right at me, and she laughed, long and hard. I just ran. I don't know if the werewolf ever pursued me. I didn't see it or hear it behind me. Still, I ran, as though my life depended on it, and I'm not sure it didn't. I made all the right turns getting home, and when I got there, I barely made it into my bed before passing out. I never talked to werewolf girl ever again. I just avoided her. I wouldn't say hello to her, and I wouldn't even look at her. I never told anyone what happened that night. Not so much because I wanted to be a good guy and not gossip, as because I was afraid she would send that werewolf after me if I told. I was honestly afraid she would make him do something terrible to me. And I figured that the more terrible a thing he did, the funnier it would be to werewolf girl. Don't go anywhere. We've got P.Q. Ribber as Dr. Death reading a classic story of a female dog man right after this. Debbie, I don't understand your cosplay costume for St. Patty's Day Northeast Comic Con. I'm going as a leprechaun from the movie Leprechaun. If he was a, like, bikini model, yo. Submission Query, A Ranger's Encounters Dear Scary Stories NYC, I am writing you as an old woman who has spent three decades of her life married to a park ranger in Michigan. My husband, who passed away five years ago, had an uncanny ability to spot things that were never supposed to be there. He would come home from his shifts in the park and tell me stories that would make me shiver in fear. He would always say that he was not allowed to talk about these things, but he had to tell someone, and that person was always me. I have never shared these stories with anyone else, but I feel that it's my duty to let them be known. I have a collection of stories in my head that my husband left behind, stories recounting his encounters with creatures that are not officially recognized by any authority. 
Some of these animals he described as having a surreal presence, while others were almost too human-like for comfort. Now I believe these stories would fit perfectly in with the Scary Stories NYC format, and I'm eager to share them with your viewers. My husband's experiences while on the job have been officially classified as confidential, but I think he would have wanted them to be heard by more than just me. He would always say, there are things that lurk in the forest that no one ever sees. I believe that these stories would be of great interest to your viewers as they delve into the unexplained and the supernatural. As I said, I have an archive of these incidents locked away in my brain, but sooner or later I will pass on, and the stories will too. I am confident that these would be of great interest to your viewership. Thank you for considering my query. I look forward to hearing back from you soon. Sincerely, etc., etc. Story number one. A dogman encounter in Michigan. One particular story that my husband shared with me involved the time he thought he was trailing a thief through the woods at night. He was working the late shift and noticed someone moving about suspiciously. My husband decided to investigate and followed the shadow for a while. As he got closer, he realized that the figure was too tall to be any human, yet it was walking on two legs. He thought that maybe he stumbled upon someone wearing stilts, but he dismissed that notion when the figure disappeared into the bushes right in front of his very eyes. While he was still puzzling over what he had just seen, my husband suddenly heard a growling sound from behind him. When he turned around, he saw an enormous dog-headed and hairy beast man on two legs. He had never seen anything like that before, but it matched the descriptions of the legendary Michigan dogman. After that night, my husband became a changed person. He was no longer the same carefree ranger who laughed off strange occurrences in the park. To his credit, he never let his fear show to the public, but he knew that he had encountered something beyond normal explanation. He made a point to tell me about his encounters, so I would always be aware of the hidden dangers in the woods. I believe that his stories can help shed light on the things that go bump in the night. I am hoping that Scary Stories NYC will be interested in publishing some more of these tales so that others can know what my husband saw. Story number two, Werewolf in the Woods. Another story my late husband told me was about his encounter with a werewolf in those woods in Michigan. It was a cold winter night, and my husband was patrolling the park when he heard a loud howling sound coming from the darkness. Curious, he ventured off the path and into the trees, where he saw a massive creature with fur as black as night and eyes that shone like gold. The beast was clearly injured. Its paw was bleeding, and it appeared to be in pain. As he approached the animal, my husband suddenly realized that it was transforming from a wolf into a man. The creature shrank down, its fur receding, and when the change was finished, it was now an elderly native man who groaned in agony. The transformation startled my husband. He didn't know what to do or say, but the injured man called out to him, weakly, asking for help. My husband quickly proceeded to offer medical assistance by dressing up his wound and offering a ride to the hospital, but the man declined, insisting that he wished to stay in the woods. Over the next few nights, my husband returned to the spot where the man had transformed, meeting the old native there and bringing him supplies. His wound healed faster than it would have on a much younger man, and the stranger admitted to my husband that there were some advantages to being able to change one's form. Apparently it speeds up the metabolism, both in terms of hair growth and in terms of healing. And so even at his advanced age, the native chose to live in caves and off the land as an animal. Those two could talk for hours about the woods the creatures that lived there, and the mysteries that they held. Both had a deep respect for that park, 
and as a result, they shared many common interests. The native man was a loner and rarely spoke to anyone, but over time, he and my husband became friends. They shared stories, secrets, and adventures, and I assure you my husband enjoyed getting to know this enigmatic stranger. Over the course of their friendship, my husband had gotten to know the man behind the werewolf and had formed a deep bond with him. The wolf man had always been able to keep his animal tendencies under control around my man, but one day, that all changed. It was a sunny afternoon, and my husband was sitting on the porch of the ranger station, enjoying the warmth and the company of a friendly cat that liked to visit him from time to time. As the cat rubbed against his leg, he saw the stranger's transformation beginning. The man who he had come to know as his friend, the werewolf, was suddenly consumed by rage and transformed into his fearsome creature form right in front of my husband's eyes. It was like something out of a horror movie, with the man's bones cracking and rearranging as fur sprouted from his skin, elongated claws extending from his hands and feet. His face twisted into something inhuman and savage, teeth bared as he let out a deafening roar. My husband was frozen for a moment, the shock of the sight before him leaving him unable to move. The good news is that the cat, sensing the danger, fled immediately. But the bad news is that the werewolf then turned his attention to my husband. His friend was wholly unrecognizable at that moment, consumed by a primal urge to kill. The werewolf lunged forward, and although my husband tried to reason with him, it was no use. The creature was beyond all logic. Without hesitation, he leaped into action, using his quick reflexes to dodge the werewolf's initial attack. The werewolf was powerful and ferocious, but my husband's trained techniques allowed him to keep his wits about him, always staying one step ahead of the creature's wild, unpredictable moves. He was able to anticipate and counter every attack, using the werewolf's own strength against it and managing eventually to subdue it. The beast would lunge. My husband would move away, belting the beast man from behind as he lost balance and slammed hard into a wall. My husband cracked a wooden chair over the werewolf's skull and barely even dazed him. It was only after a few agonizing minutes of that werewolf attacking and causing chaos that he finally calmed down and transformed back to his human form. My husband was left stunned, trying to comprehend what he had just lived through. From that day on, things were never quite the same between the two of them. Though my husband never turned his back on his friend, there was always a sense of tension and unease hanging between them. The incident made him more wary of the man behind the monster, and my husband knew he could never fully trust him in the same way again. That transformation was one of the most shocking things my husband had ever seen, and it became a reminder of just how fragile the line between humanity and savagery can be. The Orb That was not an orb. I remember the first time my husband told me about his sighting of a bizarre light orb moving through the Michigan woods at night. He had been working the late shift as usual, patrolling the park and investigating any suspicious activities. It was a quiet night, until he noticed what looked like a group of people shining flashlights in the woods. Assuming it was illegal farmers trying to tend their crops at night, he went in to investigate. As he drew closer, my husband realized that the lights weren't from flashlights at all. They were coming from a strange orb hovering two feet above the ground. What was even more unsettling than that was that the orb was making the sounds of heavy footsteps and raspy breathing. My husband was afraid to move closer, but he was also equally afraid to turn and run away. He stood there for what felt like hours, trying to make sense of what he was seeing and hearing. The orb moved through the woods, bobbing and weaving like a drunk teenager trying to walk a straight line. And the strangest part of it all was that it seemed to be following him. 
As the orb closed in, my husband said he could feel a palpable fear washing over him. He assumed it was the farmers, and that they were probably armed and dangerous. But when the orb got within just a few feet, it made an abrupt turn and disappeared into the darkness. A few months after he saw that light orb, my husband was on his usual patrol. When he saw it again, this time the orb was moving in an erratic pattern, zigzagging through the woods. As he approached it cautiously, the orb started to morph and take on a human-like form. To my husband's amazement, a huge, 15-foot-tall Bigfoot stood before him. The creature's stench was unbearable, and my husband described it as smelling like rotting meat. But what was stranger still is that the Bigfoot communicated with him telepathically, telling my husband a story about being a fallen angel from a formerly divine lineage. The Bigfoot explained in his mind that he and his people were once part of the angelic realm, but were cast out for not following divine will. My husband said that the Bigfoot's voice was as clear as if it were speaking out loud, and that he could feel the creature's emotions and his thoughts as it spoke. The Sasquatch went on to explain telepathically that it had been wandering the woods ever since it was cast out. It said that it was searching for a way to regain its former grace and become an angel once again. My husband was awestruck by the creature's story and could hardly believe what he was hearing. After this encounter, my husband's perspective on the supernatural changed. He no longer saw these beings as hoaxes or hallucinations or urban legends but as living, sentient beings with their own histories and belief systems. In sharing his story with me, my husband hoped that he could make sense of and find meaning in these encounters. He never forgot what he experienced in the woods, and neither will I. The Hodag My late husband always had a way of telling stories that would capture my attention and send shivers down my spine. One particular tale he told me that has always stuck with me was about the time he had encountered a hodag deep in the woods. If you don't already know, a hodag is a mythical creature that is supposed to exist in the town of Rhinelander, Wisconsin. According to legend, the hodag was discovered by a local logger named Eugene Shepard in the late 1800s. Shepard claimed that he had captured a fearsome creature with horns, a green reptilian body, and razor-sharp teeth that roamed the nearby forests. The story of the Hodag quickly became a sensation, and Shepard began exhibiting the stuffed body of the beast at local fairs and festivals. Despite some doubters calling him a hoax, the Hodag himself remained a source of pride and fascination for the people of Rhinelander. The town adopted the creature as its official mascot, and it has become an important part of local lore and culture. The Hodag is celebrated every summer during a festival that includes live music, food vendors, and a parade featuring the Hodag himself. But what my husband encountered was not some friendly mascot. He described the creature as being a giant, lumbering beast, similar in size to a buffalo, but with the ferocity of a lion. My husband had been out on patrol when he saw the creature feasting on berries from a bush, and he couldn't resist getting a closer look. As my ranger husband crept toward the monster, the hodag suddenly caught sight of him and let out a terrifying roar. My husband turned to run, but the animal was faster than he had anticipated and was hot on his heels. He knew that he had no chance of outrunning that giant four-legged creature, so he sought refuge in some tall grass behind a fallen log to the side of the path. The hodag charged right past him, snarling and snapping, searching for its prey. My husband lay there in the grass, frozen in terror for what felt like an eternity, until he was certain that the hodag had finally moved on. He returned home that night, shaken but alive, having experienced a brush with one of the most feared creatures of the Midwestern wilderness.
And I could picture the hodag in my mind, with its giant, gnarled horns and vicious teeth. And I couldn't help but feel grateful that my husband had survived such a dangerous encounter. Although he's no longer with me, I find comfort in remembering the stories he told and the adventures he had, even if they were sometimes terrifying. It reminds me of the raw beauty and untamed wildness of the woods, and it makes me long for the days when he was still here to explore it with me. Hey, it's your old pal Bigfoot with a hot new offer for you for summer. Snag these badass new scary stories NYC sandal slide things modeled here by your old pal Bigfoot and take 25% of the price off by using the checkout code YTSHOPPING25. It's a sweet deal for both of us because YouTube is covering that 25% discount. The link should be in the description, and if you're on YouTube and it's May or June of 2023, then you might see an image of it right under this video. It comes in five different colors, so use them to express yourselves. The strange light and missing time. One time my husband told me a truly strange tale. One that really gave me the shivers from head to toe. It seems he was out on patrol, and he heard some kind of a disturbance in the woods. He walked in there, and found a young couple in a clearing, having a big argument, and shouting a lot. When he asked them what was the problem, they told him a very crazy story. The two of them had planned a romantic evening, setting up their tent in the woods, and building themselves a campfire in a pit, surrounded by rocks to keep the fire from spreading. The girl pointed out a bright light up in the sky to her boyfriend, which then seemed to become multiple bright lights. They thought it was a police helicopter when it shone a spotlight down onto them, lighting them up blindingly bright. They shouted up at what they thought was a copter until they began to feel themselves being lifted up off the ground and flying upward into the air. Soon they found themselves in an area that they called a hospital, but the doctors and nurses were not human, nor were they your typical gray alien either. They reported being poked and prodded by a bunch of green men who seemed like reptiles and human at the same time. There were security guards stationed at the two doors, and those guards looked like upright standing canine creatures, bipedal dogmen in other words. The two kept collapsing into arguments, and they were both embarrassed because they were wearing each other's clothing. Hers was torn, being too small to fit on the young man, while his larger clothing hung loosely over his girlfriend's tiny frame. They both insisted they did not choose to be dressed like that. They claimed they woke up on the ground outside of their tent, wearing each other's clothing put on inside out. The campfire was already out and smoldering, so they must have been gone for some time before waking up. Neither of them appeared to be intoxicated, but both appeared to be in some kind of a state of shock. My husband helped them gather their things and walked them to where they had parked their vehicle. Both seemed well enough to drive themselves to the hospital, which is presumably where they went next. Well, that's a sampling of the kinds of stories he used to tell. And a couple of his buddies had some wild tales, too. Of course, none of these went into the official record because these guys all wanted to keep their jobs. Let me know if you'd like to hear any more weird ones, and I'll see what I can remember. Smithson the Werewolf Dear Scary Stories NYC I have a story for you about a werewolf I used to know back in the 1990s when I was in my 30s and living in Merrill, Wisconsin. I was walking down a path in the Kruger Pines State Natural Area on the west side of town when I saw my old friend Smithson walking toward me. He and I had attended college together back in Milwaukee and it was quite a surprise to see him where I was. Although we had been inseparable in school, I hadn't seen him in years so I immediately called out his name and hurried towards him to say hello. As we started chatting, we exchanged our current addresses and phone numbers so that we could get back in touch. After only a minute or two, though, 
Smithson suddenly began to convulse. I was shocked and horrified as I watched his body twist and twitch uncontrollably. I didn't know what to do, and my mind raced as I tried to figure out how I could help him. I asked him if he was okay, but of course he didn't respond. Instead, he simply continued to convulse and writhe, eventually falling to the ground. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest as I tried to figure out how to help. Should I call an ambulance? Should I try to give him first aid? I quickly realized that I had no idea how to help someone in the middle of this kind of a seizure. I had never been in a situation like that before, and I felt completely unprepared. In a panic, I looked around for help, but the street was deserted. The nearest hospital was miles away, and there was no one else around to help. I was alone, and I felt completely powerless. I tried to comfort Smithson as best I could, telling him that everything would be okay, and that I was there for him, but he was still convulsing. And I could see his eyes turning an amber kind of color. I felt sick as I saw his face reconstructing itself into something entirely inhuman. And it wasn't just the skeletal structure under the skin that was moving about either. I saw a nauseating dark leather blemish form on his upper lip. Then, as his face stretched out forward, the black leather fit over the end of Smithson's new elongated dog or wolf snout. He now had a black leathery dog nose at the end of rows of teeth fearsome enough to bite through your throat like it was a piece of birthday cake. This was no longer my college chum. In fact, he looked like he was going to turn me into chum. My heart was racing as I watched in horror and the spasms continued. Smithson's body began to shift and contort, his limbs stretching out and reforming into long, slender legs. A thick coat of fur sprouted from his skin, and his fingers fused to form paws. As if in a dream, I stumbled backward, unable to tear my eyes away from the scene unfolding before me. Smithson was no longer human, but a large, furry dogman with gleaming eyes that seemed to bore into my soul. For a moment I couldn't move, frozen in fear and shock, but then the dogman leaped toward me, its jaws snapping shut. Instinct kicked in, and I turned and ran as fast as I could, the sound of its growls echoing in my ears. He chased and chased. As fast as I could run, it seemed slow to him. When I finally ran out of breath, I turned and looked, and I saw those eyes. Those amber-colored eyes. I couldn't look away, as Smithson's eyes seemed to pull me in deeper, almost as if they were vortexes leading to another world. The orange color of his eyes was so vibrant. It was as if they were alive, and pulsing with energy. As I gazed into them, I thought I noticed something peculiar. It was almost as if there were tiny flames flickering inside of them, dancing and swaying to a rhythm that I couldn't hear. I felt as though I were peering into the past, present, and future simultaneously, all while being suspended in the abyss of his amber gaze. There was an otherworldly feeling that was both captivating and unnerving, like I was seeing something that I wasn't meant to see. I couldn't help but wonder what kind of secrets were hidden behind those piercing amber eyes and what kind of power they held. There was something about the orange color of his eyes that made me feel as though I were staring into the heart of a great mystery. They were both beautiful and eerie at the same time, like the eyes of an angel and a demon combined into one. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something deeply uncanny and otherworldly about Smithson's eyes. They were unlike anything I had ever seen before, as if they were portals 
to an alternate reality, a world beyond our own. For a moment, I felt myself being transported to that world, as if the flames inside Smithson's eyes had engulfed me, and I was lost in a sea of orange. But just as quickly as it had come, the feeling disappeared, leaving me feeling strangely empty as I pulled my gaze away from Smithson's strange eyes. I saw that my old friend was entirely gone, replaced by a beast, like something out of a Hollywood horror picture. The creature's eye level was the same as Smithson's had been, but then I realized it was crouching. Once it unbent its form all the way to its standing height, I had to crane my neck back to see those orange eyes, now in the skull of a beast unlike anything my eyes had ever borne witness to before. The animal charged at me, all fury and fangs, and I thought my life was over. Both his paws landed hard on my chest, and I began flying backward, my feet up off the ground. I slammed hard on my back as I landed, and then that beast landed even harder on top of me, squeezing all the air out of my lungs. And as I later found out, cracking one of my ribs in the process, but he didn't stick around to eat my face off as I expected, so I was grateful. Instead, he just used me to break his fall, then ran off somewhere behind me. I was painfully gasping for air and feeling pretty bad for some time after that, so I couldn't focus on where Smithson ran off to in his werewolf form. When I got home, I called the number he had given me, and I left a message on his answer machine. Then I collapsed into bed, avoiding my wife's questions of why I looked like I had been in a fist fight. I didn't want to talk to anyone but Smithson about what had happened, and Smithson wasn't really in shape to have a conversation at that moment. And apparently he wasn't the next day either. I called his machine and left multiple messages, but he didn't call me back, so... I was thinking that I should call the police and maybe tell them about what happened. I left him one more message saying I was going to do that, and he picked up the phone while I was talking. You could do that in those days before cell phones when we used answering machines. So, Smithson started yelling at me that I was being a jerk and interfering with his personal lifestyle or, I don't know, something to that effect. I'm not remembering his exact wording. This is a long time ago. I reminded him that he had thrown me to the ground. He's lucky I didn't have whiplash or a concussion or something like that. And he calmed down a little bit. I'm not sure he remembered that part, to be honest. We agreed to meet for lunch to talk about it, and I knew a restaurant where we could get a booth in the back and not be overheard by others. Although he did show, Smithson was reticent about divulging too many details about his werewolfism. He kept trying to pull an attitude like I was being rude and I was prying. He kept asking me if I would ask so many questions if he changed his religion or changed his political party affiliation. I laughed at the idea of comparing being a werewolf to voting Democrat or Republican, but he kept doubling down and tripling down on what he called me judging him without walking a mile in his moccasins. I reminded him that werewolves don't use moccasins, and he got up and stormed out of the restaurant. I did try to call him after that, but eventually he either moved or got his phone number changed, and I figured that was the end of our relationship for good. Well, I sort of wish it had been. One night I woke up to hear a tapping on my bedroom window. It was persistent, and sometimes got sort of frantic. It was too annoying to sleep through, though, and I began to be concerned that a bird might be stuck or something. I got up and walked over to the window, which was on the third story of an apartment building, and outside, I saw the glowing orange eyes of an upright canine, somehow balancing on a tiny ledge outside that window, far above the ground. I screamed and fell backward into some furniture, and the beast man outside my window simply jumped backward off the ledge. I got up and opened the window and screened, sticking my head out in time to see the werewolf, down three floors beneath me, running away on two legs into the woods behind our building. He wasn't injured. He wasn't even limping slightly. 
I didn't know for sure that it was Smithson, but I figured it had to be. He might not have been the only werewolf in Wisconsin, but he was the only one I was having an ongoing argument with. Not long after that, my wife and I were out celebrating our wedding anniversary at a club because she likes to dance. I admit that I had been drinking that night, so I'm not as sure of what I saw that time as I am with the other incidents. I know I, well, I think I saw Smithson. I saw him across the dance floor. I headed over toward him, leaving my wife behind me, because I wanted to have a conversation with that guy to get some things straight between us. I am positive I saw him there. Well, pretty positive. But then again, I had been drinking, so maybe it was just someone who looked like him, but when I got to the area I thought I'd seen the man in, women were screaming, and men were trying to catch this very large bat. At least it looked like a bat to me. Although it was as big as an eagle or a vulture. I just grabbed my wife and got out of that club before calling us a cab. There was no way I could explain to her what I'd seen. Either I was drunker than I thought. Or there was a shape-shifting monster inside that club that was likely to come out front looking for me if I didn't get us away from there fast. Now at this point I started to read old books I found in our library about werewolves and other supposedly fictional monsters like vampires. Did you know that in some European traditions, the vampire can change form into animals and creatures? You see it sometimes in the movies when, like Bela Lugosi or Christopher Lee will become a bat and fly away. Well, another animal associated with vampires is the wolf. Dracula himself refers to wolves as the children of the night and he calls their howling sweet music. And Dracula is also able to transform himself into a wolf at will, same way he can become a bat. No, when I read that, it really blew my mind. So Smithson might be a werewolf as I'd been thinking all along, but then again, if that huge bat I saw in that dance club was real, and judging by the screaming women it was, could that have been Smithson? And could Smithson actually not be a werewolf, but a vampire who can turn into a werewolf. Now to me the idea that a vampire can also be a werewolf as just sort of a subset of his powers exploded my skull with ideas and possibilities. The more I read about dogmen and werewolves, the more I wondered how many of the Rougarou and werewolf stories might not be about sorcerers who transform themselves into werewolves, but actually about modern day vampires who do the same thing. I was very excited about these ideas, but my wife absolutely forbids me to discuss any of this with her. So I was feeling pretty crazy, like I needed someone to bounce these ideas off of. No, I don't really want to become a person who believes in vampires, but I was literally faced with an angry werewolf already, so how much further of a jump was it really to begin to suspect that my former friend Smithson might be a vampire? Of course, the implication is that many werewolves in many sightings would then possibly be vampires as well. And that's the part that explodes a lot of the way I used to see the world. I had one more encounter with Smithson, and I hope for the love of God that it was the final one. We moved away from that place, and I'm not even going to hint about where we each moved now for obvious reasons. We had to uproot our entire lives. It feels like we practically live in a witness relocation program. But when I tell you about what happened, hopefully, you'll understand our decision. One night we went to the movies, and as my wife and I left the theater, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. The street was deserted, and the silence was deafening. I tried to shake off the weird sensation but there was something in the air that raised the hairs on my arms. Just then I heard a familiar voice call out my name. It was Smithson, my former college buddy, turned enemy. I hadn't seen him for a while, and I was a bit relieved that he was at least in human form. But there he was, bold as brass, staring us down with a cold, dead look in his eyes. Hello there, old friend, Smithson said with a devious grin. It's been too long. I wasn't sure what to say, 
But before I could even think of a response, something started to happen. Smithson began to shake and convulse right in front of us. His eyes turned yellowy amber orange. His skin stretched and contorted into an eerie shape. Before our very eyes, Smithson turned into a huge, hulking werewolf. My wife screamed, and I tried to shield her from the beast, but it was no use. Smithson had become something beyond anything I'd ever seen. The werewolf was huge, with teeth as long as my fingers and claws as sharp as knives. It growled at us with a deep, menacing sound that shook me to my core. Smithson, or the werewolf that was once Smithson, started to step closer to us. My wife huddled under my arm, trembling in fear. I knew I had one chance to save us both. With a deep breath, I reached into my pocket, and I pulled out a silver crucifix, my last line of defense. I held it out in front of us, and the werewolf flinched. I wasn't sure if it was because silver was the only thing that can defeat a werewolf, or if it was because a crucifix is considered poison to a vampire. Then again, it might have been for some other unknown reason, but in any case, he didn't like it being shoved in his face. Without a second thought, I lunged forward with my crucifix, thrusting it toward the behemoth in front of us. The werewolf let out a howl, and then it was over. Smithson lay on the pavement, shaking and convulsing, but this time he was human again. I laughed triumphantly, but before I could even finish my chuckle, he was off the ground, and with his right hand tightly around my neck, which was quite painful. I didn't realize at first that his left hand was similarly placed around the neck of my wife. Then he lifted us both off the ground, and our legs swung as he strangled us with his vice-like hands. Did you think I needed to be in wolf form to show you what I think of you? He asked me. I couldn't say anything in return. I couldn't even breathe. He could have ended everything for us both. But as we were about to pass out, he dropped us, and we fell to our knees before him. Smithson gloated about how good humans looked when they're on their knees. It almost made us seem likable, he said. Almost, but not quite. Holding my head up by the chin to make certain I was conscious, Smithson told me that my wife and I had to move out of the state before 24 hours were up. We were never allowed to physically enter Wisconsin again. And then, he detailed the terrible things he would do to my wife if I ever came back. My wife said that she couldn't leave because of her job, and Smithson told her that she was going to leave a message for her boss on his phone, telling him, well, telling him things I can't repeat here. Both of us were told to resign in an abrupt, rude, and unprofessional manner over the phone, and then be out of the state before we even made arrangements about where we would stay. And if either of us complained, Smithson said he would only make it worse, and worse. Somehow we knew that we were going to do what he was telling us to. We'd be giving up both of our careers and all of our friends and family, and we'd be putting ourselves at financial risk while we drove around jobless and homeless until we were able to put down roots in some new place, which we never really did. Not together, anyway. The stress of all this was too much, and we both took up with different people in different locations. Smithson had broken us up completely. My wife was now scared to even be around me. Whenever we communicate, she asks me if any of my other former enemies have come out of the woodwork yet. And that is the part that really bugs me. Smithson was mad at me. He is probably still mad at me to this day. But all I actually did was leave messages on his answering machine asking him if he was okay. I wasn't prying into his private life. I was inquiring about a man I thought was a friend who I had just seen suffer a horrible attack. And for that, my wife and I were torn apart. And it took us both years of hardship to create new lives for ourselves. Doesn't seem fair. 
All I was doing was looking out for an old college buddy. And now, I have none of my old friends anymore. I'm afraid to reach out to any of them. I don't want to draw Smithson's vengeful attention to them. And so I have to say, knowing a werewolf is not always all it's cracked up to be. Especially if the werewolf you know is... Smithson. We got a nice donation from a nicer bloke. Means I can eat this weekend, and that's no joke. It's a PayPal donation from Godzilla Tim. So I can keep working, all thanks to him. Please join me in thanking Godzilla Tim Walker, who made a truly life-saving donation using our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page, the page where you can make instant donations to us that go directly toward food and necessities so that we can keep the episodes coming out. You can also donate through the thanks button under each of our videos, and we get that money when YouTube pays us once a month, which is awesome too. Whichever way you prefer is appreciated by us, and believe me, it goes right back Back into the show or into my belly so I can keep doing the show. We also have cool clubs you can join. The secret uncensored dogman stories that the public isn't allowed to see. And here to tell you all about that is our international TV spokesmongrel, Henry Lee Dogman. Hank? Thanks, Biggie. And thanks to all of you for watching this far. If you liked it, please click like. If you'd like to see more of our work, please subscribe. And also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button or Join our PayPal Subscribers Club at PeterBernard.com. Joining either at the $3 a month level or above gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804 Lascari. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after I think three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Scary, scary stories. stories.